Hi there, and welcome from Ventura, California, to Unmanned Systems Navigation, Guidance, and Integrity for Autonomous Ground and Air Vehicles, sponsored by Novatel and Inside GNSS, and hosted by WebAttract, your end-to-end -end solution provider for informational webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they discuss the factors affecting operations of unmanned systems, design challenges, and solutions, and some of the options for addressing associated integrity issues. You'll have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Experts panel session with all three panelists. We've invited you, along with over 500 professionals, registered from 45 countries, 38 states and provinces, representing the following operational domains. Now, over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your domain of interest or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Before we get started, Glenn Gibbons, editor and publisher with Inside GNSS, would like to take a moment to welcome you and make a few introductions. Glenn? Thank you, Lori, and welcome to the latest installment in the Inside GNSS web seminar series. Today's presentation is sponsored by Novatel and addresses the subject of unmanned air and ground vehicles with a particular focus on positioning integrity. Based on the number of registrations, as Lori mentioned, well over 500 for today's webinar, it's clear that autonomous systems are a subject of growing interest to many of you. Now, inside GNSS webinars follow the same approach as we take to our engineering-oriented articles in the magazine, to take up issues of current importance to the GNSS community and bring subject experts to help us investigate those topics in depth. I encourage those of you viewing our presentation today to contribute to the webinar as well by responding to the questions in our online webinar polls and by sending in your questions for the live question and answer periods that will take place during the event. Sheena Dixon, product manager for Novotel Span product line is also with us today and will be able to uh, will be available for questions later in the program. And now I would like to introduce our moderator for today's web seminar, Demos Gebra Exiaber. Demos is an associate professor of aerospace engineering and mechanics at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. His research deals with the design of multi-sensor navigation and attitude determination systems for aerospace vehicles. More recently, Demos's work has focused on multi-sensor solutions for operations in GNSS stressed and GNSS denied environments. Demos, it's great to have you with us again today and welcome. Thank you, Glenn, and welcome, everyone, and we're glad you could join us today for yet another installment in uh, an Inside GNSS webinar on unmanned vehicles. Uh, the focus of today's webinar is going to be the challenging problem of integrity and its relationship to unmanned ground and aerial vehicles, and to help us understand this issue better, we've lined up a panel of three experts with long experience in building, designing, and fielding these systems and their associated navigation and guidance systems. So, to get things started, uh, we would like to conduct a quick poll to see what you, our audience, think about the issue of integrity related to guidance, navigation, and control on manned vehicles. And Lori, if you could queue up the uh, first poll. I'd be happy to, Demos. And folks, the first poll here, regulatory issues aside, what is the major guidance, navigation, control, or GNC obstacle? Uh, to the widespread use of unmanned vehicles today? And in this instance, if you just select one, all right, let's take a look. And it looks like we've got 44% uh, saying reliability and performance of existing GNC technology, 11% cost of existing GNC technology, and 45% saying lack of standards for certifying GNC technology. Demos, any thoughts there? Uh, it's a good spread over all over the issues, and as you'll see in today's webinar, we'll touch on all three of these, uh, of these aspects of, of the problem. With that, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our uh, first panelist. Our first panelist is uh, Dr. Steve Heppe. Uh, Dr. Heppe has 35 years of technical and management experience in aerospace, navigation, and communication supporting private industry, FAA, DOD, NASA, and other government agencies. He currently operates Teller Energy, Inc., a consulting firm specializing in absolute and relative positioning navigation, internet-based, and RF communication systems, spectrum management, and medical monitoring systems. 
From 2002 to 2009, Dr. Heffy was the Vice President and Chief Scientist for In-Situ Inc., a manufacturer of small robotic aircraft, including the Scan Eagle. His primary areas of responsibility included the aircraft avionics, engineering, flight safety review, support of technology, roadmap development, management of the company's portfolio, intellectual property, and spectrum planning. Uh, Dr. Heffy's current business focus is long endurance starter fair platforms using an innovative station keeping that leverages countervailing winds to minimize energy expenditure. With that, uh, Steve, I'll let you go ahead. Thanks, Demos. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm going to start the technical discussion today and set the stage for our discussion initially with aircraft, but we're also doing ground vehicles. The aircraft that we'll be talking about come in a range of shapes and sizes. You can see on this panel we have some electrics here, the Raven, the Vireo, which Todd will speak about a little more. Uh, one of my favorites for the small electrics is this little hummingbird thing from DARPA. Also, of course, there's larger um, UAVs um, that have been in the news. My favorite is the Scan Eagle down here in the lower right. And believe it or not, that's not Photoshopped. That's a real image. Um, and with, and uh, that aircraft, uh, which is built by Institu and Boeing, looks like this. It's a three meter wingspan, 20 kilograms total weight. Um, the GNSS antenna is here. You can see it's a patch antenna. And uh, we use an RTK solution to recover the aircraft. Um, we snag a vertically suspended cable with a hook on the wing. And um, I have a video sequence here that uh, we will show you to uh, give you a sense of what it looks like. So you can see it flying into the uh, cable and snagging it. The autopilot kills the engine um, as soon as it senses that it's not flying straight, straight and level. And uh, after that, we take it down and put it back in the box. So that's how we do it um, with Scan Eagle. You can imagine that that requires a high degree of accuracy. Um, in addition, the, four, the other three elements of what are, is called required navigation performance are availability, continuity, and integrity. I'm going to give an, a short example for each one of those to set the stage for the technical design, uh, discussion. Accuracy is pretty straightforward. This is a scatter plot for GPS, GNSS, I should say. You can see an error ellipse, um, but we can also create metrics that are more circular. Um, to develop uh, a measure of how accurate the system is. The second aspect of required navigation performance is availability. We normally, to, as a shorthand, say, well, can I start my mission at an arbitrary instant of time? Usually today that's not a problem because there are so many signals out there. The third aspect is continuity, which is can I continue the mission once, once it has started? Are the satellites blocked? Are they jammed? Am I flying in an urban canyon? Um, and finally, the fourth question is, can I trust what my receiver tells me? Um, the picture here is an RQ-170 that the Iranians uh, say they brought down with a spoofing attack. Uh, we may never know the truth of that. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, and we can bring that up later. Um, so there is this question of can I trust my own receiver and there's also a question of can I trust your receiver. This is something that Chris will be getting into with the land uh, applications. This is I think the most challenging aspect of uh, bringing GNSS technology uh, forward. So our goal and what we'll be talking about today is high accuracy all the time with integrity. Um, when we have all of that, the pilot is in control, all systems are working, no stress on anybody or no ex extra stress on anybody. Um, and that's, of course, where we'd like to be. And one example would be a fisheries management um, scenario where we're trying to keep track of uh, fishing vessels and we need to know where we are, we need to know where they are. Um, what if something goes wrong? Well, if we lose a command link, the aircraft needs to navigate autonomously back to base. So clearly that's a, an argument for all the time with integrity. Um, if we lose that, then the pilot can navigate back. If 
uh, if they have visual key, uh, clues, for example. And then finally, of course, there's the potential for both systems to be down, which is a uh, very difficult situation for an unmanned aircraft. With that, I'm going to uh, pass it back to Demos. Thank you, Steve. All right, so to put things in context, our next panelist, will, uh, who's Todd Colton, will tell us a little bit about uh, unmanned aerial systems that he's uh, building and designing. Uh, Mr. Colton is an expert in uh, small unmanned aircraft and small unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, he, uh, he has been developing, uh, testing, training, and supporting small unmanned aircraft systems since 2002. He has worked on over a dozen unmanned aircraft ranging from research and development micro-sized aircraft to production mini aircraft such as the Lockheed Martin, Desert Hawk family, and the large unmanned aircraft including variants of the Predator B. Currently, he's the lead aircraft engineer for the Small Unmanned Aircraft System Product Development Group at United Technologies Aerospace Systems. He's lead airframe designer on a family of small aircraft uh, that he will be talking about today. Uh, prior to working with unmanned aircraft, Mr. Colton was an uh, aircraft installation engineer on a variety of aircraft modification upgrades, including the P-3 Orion and the C-130. Todd? Uh, thanks for that introduction, Demos. I'm glad to be here and uh, looking forward to talking with everybody on the line. I'm going to talk primarily about small UAVs, our small unmanned aircraft systems, um, typically hand-launched and typically electric-powered. That's sort of a different, uh, just one category of uh, in the broad spectrum here. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of where they came from, uh, the traditional military uses, but more importantly, where they're going in the future, um, which is there's a big, big opening market for civil and commercial uses um, for unmanned systems in general, and in particular for small unmanned aircraft systems. So uh, before I jump into it, though, I just uh, wanted to touch a little bit about terminology uh, and what do we call these things. Uh, uh, a lot of people call them UAVs. Sometimes it's UAS, uh, and then the media, of course, loves the term drone. Um, in the industry, we don't use the word drone too much. Uh, we feel it implies too many things. Um, but just some of the other terms we've got here, and if you hear them, they're all sort of interchangeable. Uh, UAV stands for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle. UAS is Unmanned Aircraft System. Um, the idea there is that, well, we used to say UAV, but it's really more than just an aerial vehicle. There's a whole ground element, ground control station, and other pieces to the system. Um, and sometimes people interchange the word aerial and aircraft. Uh, the FAA just likes to use the word unmanned aircraft. Uh, they they feel that or the purview of the FAA is to maintain right to, to regulate and maintain s safety of the nation's airspace. So uh, they don't care quite as much about the ground piece of it. Um, they they like to deal with just the aircraft. And the U.S. Air Force uh, recently has been shying away from all those terms, and is trying to use the promote the term remote piloted aircraft, which is probably the most accurate term because uh, it's too easy to forget that there's always still a pilot. There's always still a person in charge behind the scenes, um, you know, ultimately responsible for the operation of the unmanned system. Uh, they're just usually remotely located on the ground. Um, so this is the Vireo UAS. This is, a uh, uh, again, a small hand launch electric UAV that we've developed at UTC Aerospace Systems. It has a one meter wingspan, has a one, one and a half kilogram gross weight. It's electrically powered. It uh, can carry several different camera payloads, um, either regular color, uh, infrared payloads, and special payloads for agriculture, for example, that look at spec uh, multispectral and different spectral signatures of plants. Uh, this UAV was designed primarily to go after um, civil and commercial markets. Uh, it's, it's, again, hand-launched. It's controlled from the ground using just a tablet or, or small laptop. And there's a data link that uh, talks to the airplane from the ground station. And the Vireo is unique in the sense that it can convert not only from a traditional fixed-wing small UAV, but it can convert to a vertical takeoff and land quad rotor UAV. It's pictured down in the corner there that shows how you can take the wings off and just snap in a quad rotor kit. So a lot of these small UAVs that you see flying around in the news or other places, um, sometimes they're traditional uh, fixed wing aircraft, but a lot, of, a lot of them, especially the past couple of years or so, have been these vertical takeoff and land 
platforms that allow, you know, they're really good camera platforms essentially. So this is uh, kind of outlines the basic architecture of a small UAV. Um, you know, what, what's in, what's in, what are in these things? What makes them up? So there's two main elements. You've got the unmanned aircraft, the piece that, that is flying around in the sky, and then you've got a ground control station, the, the, the control element that's on the ground. So I'll start with the unmanned aircraft. If you um, look in the upper right of that section there with the autopilot, um, the autopilot is really the heart of the system, and typically the, for these small unmanned aircraft, the autopilot will have an integrated inertial navigation system, and they're typically using MEMS-based gyros and accelerometers, relatively low cost, um, and that will be paired up with a GPS. And so the GPS, or some sort of GNSS, is really what makes the whole thing possible, um, the ability to sort of aid and correct those low-cost MEM sensors to keep the thing flying around in the sky. Uh, there's a data link, and that data link is what, you know, ties the whole system to the ground. So you see the dashed line that goes to corresponding data link on the ground control station. And then back over to the air, airplane, there's some other sensors on board as well. You've got an airspeed sensor typically, so you can find, figure out how far, how fast you're flying and how high. And you'll have different payload sensors. Um, Typically, they're cameras of some sort or another, but they can be other sensors as well. And in, our, in the case of the Vireo or a lot of these small um, small unmanned systems, they'd be electrically powered, so you've got a battery and an electric motor. On the ground station, it's uh, important to remember that the pilot is part of the system. And uh, oftentimes for these small UAVs or UAVs in general, we might call them an operator instead of a pilot, although really, you know, they are the pilot, they're in charge, uh, they're, they're calling all the shots, even though they may not be flying truly stick and rudder. Uh, you've got the data link, and then you've got your mission map display, and that's where the pilot will actually plan out a mission, typically waypoint-based. Um, you know, you'll have uh, lat long altitude, a series of waypoints or orbits or other, other mission points, and those um, will almost always be pre-programmed pre -programmed before you fly a mission, but often will be adjusted during flight and um, dynamically replanned. And then of course you've got touchscreen controls for uh, doing different different things that the airplane would, would need to do. Um, you get health and wellness information coming down as well. And typically some sort of video or payload preview. Um, so, so traditionally these things were developed for the military um, really over the past decade. Uh, the number of, of unmanned aircraft systems has really exploded to the point where they've become ubiquitous. Um, and, and they're used for, they've been used very successfully for all sorts of applications, ranging from short range stuff over the hill or down the road surveillance to, or uh, reconnaissance to broad area surveillance, you know, the high flyer, flyers, and all the way to the point of weaponization with um, some of the aircraft out there, for example, the the Predator B or the Reaper, and you hear about, that's typically what you hear about in the news when they talk about drones or drone attacks, um, but really there's a whole much larger world of unmanned aircraft systems behind that. And I bring this up, talk about the military applications that have been really over the past decade or so. Um, if you look on the right here at the top, there's that, that Raven, which, which is a hand launch electric UAV. That's been built in very large numbers. I mean, tens of thousands of Ravens have been built and deployed. And as you go down, as the UAVs get bigger, uh, there really there's been less and less of them, all the way to the point where down at the bottom there, you've got the Global Hawk, which is uh, probably the highest altitude, largest UAV that uh, you hear about out there. And they've really only built a few dozen of those. So the reason I bring the, bring up the the fact that there's a lot more smaller UAVs than large ones on the military side is that that's probably going to mirror what's going to happen in the commercial market that's going to be uh, uh, kind of it's kind of just emerging right now. So the FAA sometime in the next year or two is expected to allow come out with sort of new regulations that will allow commercial operations of, uh, in particular for small UAVs um, and Large UAVs will be coming as well, but 
every all indications right now is that the FAA is going to take a longer time to to develop um, the regulations for those, and that has a lot to do with safety issues and and some other things. But in, in terms of the small UAVs, the business the business models have already been proven at least on on a small scale. So uh, you know, commercial uses, you know, not non military uses. The inter entertainment industry. Um, has been using them actually for a long time with remote controlled helicopters with with movie cameras hung below them. Um, agriculture is starting to use it. Uh, agriculture is always a little bit slow to to pick up new technology, but you know at the same time it's very you know once they do pick it up, it, they really embrace it once it's proven that it can save money. I'll actually talk about agriculture in more detail in a moment. Um, but law enforcement and first responders, you know, search and rescue, those type of missions, uh, they're already doing that on a small scale. And then aerial photography and real estate. So these are all things that the business models have been proven, and, you know, it's just only going to grow from here. Um, so just to, you know, reiterate the point I've been making, uh, the small UAVs are going to be used in, in pretty, you know, much higher numbers than than others. and when you're thinking about small UAVs, you have to think about low altitude, and you also also have to think about low cost. So, um, what's really enabled us to get to where we are now is the mobile phone miniaturization of sensors and um, somewhat automotive industry as well. Uh, it's been it's been a big enabler that allows us to get all that capability down into these small, low cost um, aircraft. Uh, but at the same time, they're somewhat low performance relative to the bigger stuff. So that's a challenge moving forward. Um, and again, just to, just to hone in on it, agriculture, aerial mapping, orthophotography, real estate, infrastructure monitoring, security, wildlife and forestry management, movies, commercials, entertainment. Um, these, there's there's going to be a big commercial market for this stuff moving forward. Just even last night, uh, 10 o'clock news on my, my local news channel, uh, they had some footage, aerial footage from what was obviously one of these small uh, quadcopters with a little camera on board. So it's um it's happening now and it's happening fast, and so it you know there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so it, uh, I just want to touch on aerial uh, agriculture, precision agriculture, and aerial mapping in particular. Um, so this is one of the th one of the markets where there's actually you know dollars and cents behind it when and that's what's gonna what's gonna push it um, it it turns out that there's there's certain sensors that you can put on these small UAVs that can look at you know measure crop health just from um, uh, looking at different wavelengths of light essentially looking at near infrared red and green wavelengths of light uh, they call that NDVI normalized difference vegetation index and you know Basically, using small, low-cost cell phone-type cameras with with certain filters, special filters, you can fly over a field back and forth, kind of like a lawnmower pattern. Take a whole bunch of snapshots, mosaic all those together, um, geo-register all of those, and take you know various different colors or different snapshots, overlay them, run them through algorithms, and come up with this uh, false color image that shows, in this case, right here in the middle of the slide. Green is healthy and red is uh, not so healthy. Um, and that information can be fed directly back into the tractor that goes. The tractors are driving around with GNSS systems on board and basically, basically autopilots on board the, the tractor that drives it around the field. And that feeds right into a variable rate fertilizer system that precisely controls how much fertilizer gets put down where on the field. Um, so. You know, if they can get to the point, and and they've been and they've been showing that they can, even if they just are able to save on average one dollar an acre for some of these large fields, um, that's enough to justify uh, doing this and and buying these type of systems. So, uh, and for those of us who live in the Midwest, um, there are an awful lot of farm fields out there. So it's uh, there's there's big opportunity, um, but there's a lot of challenges that. To get there, uh, a lot of this technology is still immature, um, and getting it to the point where it can be easily used can create data formats that feed into the industry and the rest. Um, there's a lot of work to do there. 
So um, on that, uh, what are the needs from a, a small UAV standpoint? Uh, what type of precision navigation needs uh, do we need for, from a commercial standpoint? Uh, there's a lot of overlap with what military UAVs have needed over the past decade, but there's kind of a special focus on improving performance of the small and low-cost sensors and small and low-cost systems. Um, so how do you ensure reliability and robustness of those systems, uh, you know, of, of, the, of the cheap stuff, right? Uh, how do you do accurate landings with robust control, um, you know, if, if we can't afford uh, expensive RTK system, uh, both from a weight and cost standpoint on these small systems? How do we, how do, we do that? How do we uh, land accurately every time and not crash into, say, your car or the building you're trying to last, land next to or whatever? Um, how do you geo-register all that imagery, and how do you convert it to useful data formats that can be used in these commercial applications? Uh, you know, there's huge amounts of data that, that get collected. These, uh, you know, these you can go to Best Buy now and buy a 24 megapixel point-and-shoot camera. Um, imagine t using that, taking uh, a thousand pictures of a of a farm field. You know, what do you do with all that data? And then, uh, you know, payload and image stabilization. Um, imagery enhancement, you know, there's there's lots of uh, issues to solve there with um, uh, wobbly video or not perfect images, uh, many others. So that's sort of that's sort of the overview. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Demos. Thank you, Todd. Uh, all right, so we're at that point where I guess we'll take a pause and let you, our audience, ask the uh, ex panelists give the first question. For, uh, for Todd here. Talked about all these uh, applications uh, coming up um, and, 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 the, and the UAVs you're making. How autonomous are these systems? Uh, I mean, how much training is required, um, et cetera, to operate them? Does a person really have to be highly trained to be able to operate some of these vehicles? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I like that because it kind of touches on the point I made earlier about sort of the word drone really implies kind of a you know, an autonomous, almost sentient type system that's flying around and isn't really in control by a human being. And in effect, you know, the opposite is really the case. Um, there's always a human in the loop. There's always somebody controlling these things, even from the large aircraft down to the small aircraft. Uh, the systems that we're developing at UTC Aerospace Systems, the Vero UAV, for example, um, even though there's an operator, there's really no stick and rudder flying like a traditional RC airplane or anything like that. So the operator basically plans out a mission, plans the waypoints, uh, commands the airplane to, to launch, to fly the route to the different points and land. But really, um, it's basically on autopilot that whole time. So the, it, it, it takes off autonomously, it flies the route autonomously, and it lands autonomously. But the operator is always in control, can always override what the airplane is doing can always direct it to go do something else and um, and doesn't really need to have any true piloting skills uh, it's it's almost more like a video game at that point all right Th thank you Todd uh, I mean uh, although this question wasn't fielded to you uh, uh, Steve do you have any comment on that, that question on from your experience with uh, scan eagle well I would uh, I'd agree that the um the human is always in the loop, and uh, we have a rather extensive training program um, that runs, if I recall, um, a minimum of a month to train up an operator or a pilot to operate a Scan Eagle aircraft. And that's uh, like any other field. Uh, when you graduate from that program, um, you're still um, there's still a lot of um, training and experience that you need um, that you get on the job. So um, it is important to uh, train up the uh, the operators not only with how to operate the aircraft but also the rules of the road. What what uh, what does every pilot need? I think the FAA is actually requiring people to be. Um, I don't recall where the regulations are headed just now, but uh, I believe that um, there's a push to have um, operators or pilots of unmanned aircraft be real pilots and. Uh, because they really are flying a plane and they need to interact with everyone else in the airspace. Yeah, I'll just add to that. That's that's correct. Um, in fact, 
that they they're they're at least what they're allowing right now is for them to be real pilots. I just I was actually just instructing a training course last week, and we had groups of students going through. They were able to train up on our system in just three days. However, coming in, they were all already manned pilots, so they had a whole lot of aviation knowledge to start with. All right. Thank you very much. I guess Todd and Steve again. Um, well, maybe for Todd first is are are the systems that are avionics that are being used on uh, the UAVs? Do they use WAS? Are they WAS enabled? Is that required? Anything you comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'd say it. So there's no requirement. However, um, the GPS or the GNS systems we use on our our aircraft are WAS enabled. So if WAS is available, it will use that, and it definitely helps. Um, helps it fly a bit better and know where it is in the world. Uh, so WAS is a good thing from my, my perspective. All right. Uh, do, you want, do you want to add to that, Steve? Yes, I'd, uh, I'd agree. Um, our aircraft basically use the, uh, the same method and approach. Uh, WAS is not available worldwide, but uh, it is becoming um, more available as other countries um, Launch launch their systems, so it's definitely a, a benefit, but it's not uh, a cure all in the sense that it it doesn't completely solve all the problems we'll be talking about today. But certainly, if it's available, you want to rely on it. All right, thanks, Steve. All right, so uh, with uh, on the sake of time, we need to move on to the uh, remaining part of the, of the presentation. There are a lot of questions that came in on on integrity details, which I think Steve will uh, answer in the. Uh, um, next set of uh, slides that he's going to be presenting. So with that, let me hand it over to uh, Steve. Steve? Okay, thanks again. For the second part, what I'd like to focus on, um, the RNP parameters as we talked about were accuracy, availability, continuity, and integrity. I'm going to focus on those last three and I'm going to kind of summarize that as all the time with integrity. So that's uh, going to be the focus of this portion of the webinar. Addressing the all the time um, portion of this, there is um, unintentional interference. I'm going to talk about three main uh, things that can go wrong. There's unintentional interference, which is the subject of this chart. We're also going to be concerned about intentional interference or jamming, and then spoofing, where um, a, a bad person, a really bad person, actually tries to take control of your receiver and uh, and make you believe that you're somewhere you're not or that you're going in some direction that you're not. But even without all of that intentional bad stuff going on, there's still unintentional stuff. There's a lot of electronics out there. I've shown some of the things that could um, adversely affect a GNSS receiver. These things could be as simple as cell phones or laptop computers, broadcast towers for FM and TV broadcast stations, uh, rotating machinery, um, uh, some satellite communications equipment can also do it. These things can all uh, cause your GNSS receiver to lose lock, and it'll normally tell you when it's lost lock, um, but that's not a good thing if it loses lock. Uh, this is one example. Uh, historically, this took place back in 2001. It was an unintentional interference event that uh, jammed GNSS out for uh, in a uh, radius of about a kilometer, and the the cause was a malfunctioning satellite TV uh, uh, or VHF UHF antenna, an active antenna that was in a little private boat in this marina. Um, it took a long time to find this interferer. So people knew they were getting jammed, but it took a while to find it and, and solve the problem, which highlights an issue that we have, which is that um, trying to solve this problem with um, externally is uh, not always the best approach. It's too time consuming. We need to find something better. In addition to these unintentional um, threats, there are intentional threats. So here are two um, particular jammers that are available on the internet, although they're illegal, but they are available on the internet. Um, the little one on the left plugs into a cigarette lighter in a car. The one on the right is uh, won't plug into a cigarette lighter, but it's also available on the internet. A 500 milliwatt jammer can uh, jam GNSS for um, many tens of miles. Um, so 
these are very um, dangerous threats, and they're out there today. These are, this is not science fiction. They're out there being used. Why do people do that? There's several reasons. Um, some might uh, just want privacy. There's also, of course, the terrorist angle. It turns out, however, that criminal activity is the primary motivator for people that use these sorts of jammers. Um, so we live in a strange world. Uh, but in fact, these things are out there. And because the criminal activity has an economic motivator, um, it's difficult to eliminate all um, use of these jammers. In addition to unintentional and intentional interference, there's the problem of spoofing. Um, for a long time, many people thought that this couldn't actually happen. Um, but in fact, it can happen. It's easier than you might think. Um, on the right-hand side, we have this picture of the RQ-170 that I had earlier. Um, Iran says they brought this aircraft down with a spoofing attack. Uh, we may never know for sure, but that the attack that they outlined in the open press was doable. Um, if you look at how they said they did it, that would have been effective against a variety of UAVs. So it's something to watch out for. On the left-hand side, we have an example that was uh, put together by Todd Humphreys at University of Texas, and he was able to force down this uh, small um, uh, rotary wing uh, UAV, which had a very sophisticated autopilot and a guidance system. So uh, this is a threat that can address or can go after a variety of UAVs, not just the uh, simple ones. It's a real concern. There are two types of spoofing, actually. Um, most people, when you think about, or when you say spoofing, think about a navigation signal spoof. Um, that's where you create false signals, and the GPS receiver locks onto them and, uh, uh, and then is fooled about where it is or where it's going. That is actually challenging, and it's getting harder all the time as the signals evolve. Um, the newer signal sets are much more difficult to spoof than the old ones. But it's still feasible for a determined individual. And if the victim is complicit, uh, for example, if the victim is actually in on the thing because they're a criminal and they're trying to do something wrong, then it's actually rather straightforward. But even um, beyond a nav signal spoof, there's a concern about the data link if you are using a differential system. Most differential data links are not authenticated, and as a consequence, someone can fake the data link and inject uh, false and misleading information which could guide the receiver off its uh, intended path. No receiver that I'm familiar with is actually designed to detect and respond correctly to these threats. Uh, so this is a serious um, gap in our, in our technical development here that needs to be addressed by people in the community. So the moral of the story is don't rely on Mother Nature or government regulations to protect you. Um, things break. Equipment goes wrong, and uh, people are intentionally trying to hurt you, so you need to be cautious and proactive. Expect the worst, and um, we'll go over some solutions now of what you might do to overcome it. Uh, even in the absence of malicious activity, there's always the concern of a false lock on a GPS or GNSS signal. Um, you want to verify the output. So solutions for that sort of problem, just uh, against Mother Nature, would be receiver self-checks, receiver autonomous integrity monitoring, and vector tracking. I'm a firm believer in vector tracking. Uh, I think people are starting to recognize that that is a tremendous technology that can really help um, improve the robustness of, of our systems, and we'll talk about that more. For space segment error, uh, which is rare, but still potentially um, something that you'll run into, again, you would want RAIM. Uh, you would like to use multiple GNSS constellations if you're allowed to use them. External sensors, like an autopilot or a barrel altimeter, um, other sorts of nav systems can all help you to overcome this sort of problem. For navigation signal spoofing, again, this is where vector tracking really comes uh, to the fore. Authenticating this, the uh, 
the signals from space would be a tremendous uh, boon to the user community. Galileo provides for this. Um, the GPS system does not. I think it's one place where Galileo is ahead of us and uh, is doing some uh, very good things. There's also a number of syndromes that you can look for, sim symptoms, if you will. Um, signal to noise ratio monitors, uh, Doppler, um, differential Doppler, all sorts of cross checking uh, that can help you to identify when someone is trying to uh, uh, sneak his way into your receiver. And for the data link spoof, um, which these days is actually trivially easy, the best solution is authentication, and that makes it incredibly hard. So authentication, both for the signals in space and the data link, are um, are very, uh, very important. So to enhance the integrity, to summarize uh, what we've just been going over, you would first of all want to rely on the latest GNSS signal sets. The data-free signals in particular can be tracked with very narrow filters, and that's an incredible benefit. Galileo, uh, the idea of authenticating the space-based signals is very important, and if you're able to use Galileo, I recommend it. Cross-constellation uh, cross-checks are very good. And then it turns out that every GNSS receiver is required by its operation to generate a number of internal metrics, and those metrics can be used to detect the onset of spoofing. These days, most receiver manufacturers don't rely on the metrics for that purpose, but they could with additional effort, and uh, that would be an enormous benefit to the community. Use external cross-checks if you can. Um, push for vector tracking, which is a technology development area. Uh, I don't uh, they're not really widely available yet, but that is a, um, a very excellent technology. And then uh, for the autopilot, it turns out that the autopilot is a potential weakness, um, and you cannot ignore how the autopilot is handling um, its job if you want a really reliable solution. So what would be the ideal position, navigation, and timing system for a UAV if we didn't care about size, weight, and power, and we had an infinite budget? Well, you would start with a redundant GNSS receiver, because hardware things can break. You'd probably add a beam-forming antenna to uh, provide nulling of jamming, of jammers, and as well as uh, unintentional interference. You'd add a triply redundant inertial navigation system to take care of the case when you're uh, jammed or spoofed anyway, and you'd authenticate your data link. So that's what you would do if um, you had the luxury of not caring about any practical uh, realities of life. But of course, this is completely impractical for most UAVs, especially for most small UAVs. So a realistic PNT system would start with a high-end GNSS receiver using the latest signal sets. You would add a consumer-grade inertial um, measurement unit, uh, automotive or so, for short-term coasting. And these are generally what's inside most small um, UAV autopilots. You'd want to add a magnetic compass and a barrow altimeter. They're relatively inexpensive and, and lightweight and uh, provide extended coasting time for the IMU, and of course you would want to authenticate your data links. And that's what most of us fly with today. So there are a couple embellishments that I'll mention very briefly. Uh, if you wanted to go beyond that basic system, you could look to external navigation systems, VOR, DME, and uh, ELORAN would be wonderful, but they don't work everywhere, particularly the middle of the ocean. You could do cell phone ranging and navigation, which is an excellent solution in urban and suburban areas, but again, it doesn't work everywhere. You could add a camera-based solution, since most UAVs already have a camera. Um, however, getting autonomous camera-based navigation is a challenging problem, and even a camera-based solution doesn't work everywhere, over oceans, at night, in fog. And finally, you could use your own data link, um, particularly if you have a high gain tracking antenna on the ground, um, which may take this out of the realm of small UAVs, but for larger aircraft with a high gain antenna, you can get a range and bearing estimate, uh, which can allow you to navigate uh, 
using your own data lake. So those are all possible solutions. To summarize, um, think before you build because it's always harder to change something than to do it right the first time. Leverage the latest GNSS signal sets. The receivers are relatively low cost and the benefits are enormous. Combine your GNSS with reasonable and cost-effective external sensors. Authenticate everything. Test, and when you think you've done testing, test again. And when you've done it a second time, go back and do it a third time because testing is what saves us. With that, I'll turn it back to demos. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let's do another poll here. Lori, if you could queue up the poll, please. I'd be happy to. Folks, coming up on your screen, it's that second poll. And in your experience, uh, the most demanding levels of integrity are associated with? And it comes out as 50% uh, of you, uh, just half unmanned aerial vehicles, 11% unmanned ground vehicles. 37% aerial and ground vehicles equally, and 3% saying neither since no one would use them in safety critical applications. So, uh, Demos, any thoughts there? Uh, well, based on the questions that are coming in, I'm not surprised about the last one, but um, as you'll see our next presenter presenting, you'll see that actually with unmanned ground vehicles, there is a big need for integrity, and so this is actually a very interesting uh, result. So, with that, let me introduce our uh, third panelist. and. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Chris Wilson. Uh, Christopher Wilson is the CEO of Vehicle Data Science, a startup focused on supporting automated and semi-automated vehicle by building behavioral models from connected vehicle data. He has authored, he has consulted in the areas of connected vehicle technology, supporting both vehicle manufacturers and insurance companies around the topics of safety and efficiency. From 2008 to 2011, he was the director of product management for advanced driver assistance systems at TomTom. From 1996 to 2008, he was with uh, Daimler Chrysler Research North America, including uh, working on the VP and ITS programs and strategy. His work is focused on vehicle positioning, mapping, communications, both for commercial and government and industry consortium. And before uh, he developed space, before doing automotive stuff, he uh, uh, developed spacecraft reconnaissance systems for TRW and GTE. With that, Chris. Thank you, Demos. Um, well, I hope that I'm going to prove some of you wrong in that last poll because I think the the demands on the ground segment are really p pretty intense. So I, I wanted to start this with this image, which was from the DARPA Grand Challenge held almost 10 years ago. Um, this vehicle was in the press a lot, and I think this really started a lot of the movement towards unmanned um, vehicle research. Um, you know, obviously, really interesting vehicle, but not something you'd probably find. Um, you know, on the roads yet, but what I want to talk about here is ground vehicles that you and I might be driving in the next decade or so. I'll talk a little bit about their current status, then I'm going to move into, uh, you know, absolute positioning systems, very similar to the ones we've heard about for aerial vehicles, and, but also go towards relative positioning systems, which are, I think, much more important for ground vehicles as well as the contextual information that's necessary for relevant or relative positioning and then uh, cooperative systems based on communications between vehicles. So to start off with here, um, this is a set of uh, unmanned automated vehicles that are exist today on the left. Um, those are tractors much as Todd referred to. This is the the business end, if you will, of um, automated farming. Those are automated tractors can go out and drop those fertilizers or pesticides where you need them. In the middle is a set of vehicles that some of you may have seen around on the roads today. Um, these work on real roads, un unlike the vehicles on the left, which are highly constrained to farmers' fields and not a lot of other stuff going on around and, and opens, they've got the open sky. The vehicles in the middle there are working on regular roads, but these are obviously fairly researchy vehicles. The sensor on top of the, the Google car here at the bottom, that's a $60,000 sensor. Um, also, the vehicle designers don't tend to like things like that. But if you look over on the right side, these are vehicles that are coming out of automotive manufacturers today for research purposes, but these are um, 
basically automated vehicles using automotive quality sensors. There's a few more of them in these cars, but there's nothing really new here. Um, and these vehicles are, you know, being tested now. We'll be driving them within the next decade. Some of us will. Here's the the basic layout from a law perspective. I think many of you know certain states are allowing testing of driverless cars. They are also developing the licensing rules, so presumably when you can go and buy one of these things, various states will understand uh, you know, what you have to do and what the vehicle has to do in order to get that license. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about man, um, what skills you need to handle a UAV in the air, so what are the licensing rules for you know, somebody operating one on the ground? I mean, really interesting questions. Um, people are also interested in certification, and this is where NHTSA is playing a big role. They're very actively trying to define, you know, what test does a vehicle have to pass in order to be on the road or to be sold in the United States. And they've put in four categories, essentially, of automation. There's the um, automated single function, such as la longitudinal or lateral control. Those, those systems exist today in automated cruise control or lane departure warning integrated systems which will handle sort of two of those things at a time so it it's totally automated but the driver has to be right there and those systems are available this year you can buy those through traffic jam assist types of applications um, the next two are the really interesting ones the system where the driver is needed occasionally so an automated vehicle that may drive totally fine on freeways but uh, is not automated on residential roads so the driver needs to be, there needs to be a handoff between the driver and the vehicle. So there are some interesting issues there. And, you know, the final level four certification, this is where, you know, you call your car on the phone, it comes and picks you up, and you tell it to go park, and it, it does all that. So that's somewhere out there. A um, lot of interest in this. The White House is developing a position on this whole topic. They really look at it from a, a productivity perspective of how this could help the United States move forward if people were working in their cars instead of stuck at, like, staring at the wheel. Uh, there's a hearing in Congress next week on automated vehicles. The path to automation is not new. I mean, I, I said the DARPA Grand Challenge was about 10 years ago. That's true, but automation started really in the 70s. The you know advent of ABS systems where some software designers really controlling how the brakes on your car work that that's the start of automation a lot of research in the late 70s um, but I do think the DARPA Grand Challenge really brought it to the front we're now seeing claims of you know totally automated vehicles that you and I will be able to purchase in uh, five years from last year by Google Nissan's talking about all models they provide by 2020 um, it's not clear exactly what automation means in these contexts, but it's certainly coming, and, and every car company is making statements along these lines. Um, I do want to emphasize that as of 2014 model year, some cars are totally automated within a very narrow envelope. In this case, it's this traffic jam. You're in a traffic jam on a freeway, a very controlled um, driving envelope. You could if the vehicle would let you take your hand off the wheel and the car would drive in that situation it's and I expect what's going to happen and this is one model going forward is that envelope will get better and so right now it maybe only works only below 35 miles an hour and maybe next year it's 45 and the following year it's under 60 and then maybe it moves on to arterial streets I think that's sort of one method we see going forward there's a significant body of people that believe the other approach is just to cut the people out of the loop. You know, humans cause more trouble than benefits here, and we just go to that level four automation directly where um, vehicles drive themselves. Big debate in the community right now. How do these vehicles work? Um, there's a pretty standard set of sensors you see here. They all have, every automated vehicle has GPS, IMU, some sort of a map. Um, associated with it, some sort of communications, at least for updating that map, possibly for other features. Um, every vehicle has radars, cameras, and LIDAR. The various combinations 
of these are dependent on who's building the vehicle. And there's no consensus on you know, do you need two or all three of these, and, and where do you put your resources and your your processing. Um, I think that is still to be worked out, but you know, all, all the senses systems basically look like this. Here are um, some systems based on absolute positioning. This all this this line of research started back in the um, you know early 90s, I guess mid to late 90s with the development of RTK. There were a number of vehicles driving around that you know could have been automated within these controlled environments. These two vehicles here are racing cars, so they are designed to drive around a track at high speed, and they are almost as good as the very best drivers out there um, in these cons very constrained driving environments of a racetrack. Um, on the left-hand side, you see Stanford's Shelley, which races up the Pikes Peak race. They've done that. So, um, you know, pretty neat technology. And you can imagine this for automated vehicles that we just have to build the, the pathway between every driveway. So essentially, um, somebody would go out, make these maps, uh, I'd start up my car, tell it where I want to go, and it would get on one of these paths and um, go to, to your driveway. The, you know, this is very similar to the airborne approach, but obviously we have a few more problems here on the ground. The obstructions, uh, tunnels, urban canyons, trucks next to you that might be messing with your GPS, um, those are pretty obvious. You also have some really severe accuracy problems. If, you know, arguably, if you're in the air and you're off by two meters, not a big deal. If you're off by two meters on a highway, uh, there can be a lot of very bad things happening very, very quickly. So to get, you know, if you're going to rely totally on absolute positioning, you need accuracy on the order of, um, you know, half a meter or, or less. And keep in mind, you know, there's millions and millions of driving hours every day. So if all of those vehicles are out there and need this level of integrity, you know, you need a lot of nines in order to make the system reliable. Of course, we also have the context, um, you know, who's going to build these maps, and then how do you deal with dynamic obstacles, other vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, etc. So for a lot of these reasons, the um, industry has looked to relative positioning. So that is essentially figuring out where I am relative to things around me, ignoring the absolute latitude-longitude system. For many years, the automotive industry focused on this sort of feature search model of that I'd go out there and, much like a human does, I'd go and find a, a dotted white line or a solid yellow line, and I'd, I'd orient myself and I'd, I'd follow that, which is a great approach as long as the road markings are there and uh, you know what to look for. More recently, there's been this sort of scene matching approach, and you know, Google, I think, is the big advocate for this where you essentially drive a vehicle down a road, collect all sorts of data, um, then go back and pre-compute a path for, through that data set offline. Uh, you can deal with a lot of problems that way. You build a set of landmarks uh, that the vehicle is going to follow as it drives down this path. And um, you know everything works great as long as the, the landmarks stay there and nothing changes much. The you know really big issue with this is the need for this extensive map of all those landmarks in the vehicle. Um, the maps are a problem. The accuracy of the map needs to be commensurate with the position accuracy of the vehicle. The you know way to build these maps, you know Google's demonstrated, Nokia's doing that. Building and constructing these maps is pretty well known, but how to maintain a map at this level and provide dissemination of that map from a server out to a vehicle, these are still very large questions, open issues there. Um, you know, if you need to survey this road before driving it, when do you need to do it again? At, at what point has there been enough change that uh, you know, we shouldn't allow it for automation? How do you detect that it's time to go? That, that, that it snowed and you need to go and, and check things out or there's been construction. Even when you do that, you then have to get this 
fairly large map out to a vehicle in relatively short time period. Um, you know, small data sets to a car are, are a problem even today. A huge data sets, it, it's really unsolved right now. May all go away in the future, but it may not. One really nice thing about maps is that they link absolute position to the relative position. So by, by having that monument or feature in this uh, map, we can figure out its absolute position by knowing where the vehicle is in relation to that. I can tie the two coordinate systems together. And this also provides uh, you know, a lot of value. Um, a lot of this comes to a head when you start talking about vehicles communicating with each other. And this is something I've been working on for many years. And there's major efforts worldwide to establish a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle data link. Um, possibility of the US starting a mandate process here in the next few months about mandating that data link here for us. The primary data sent over that data link will be location information. Uh, the little table on the right shows a test done by DOT where there was a number of different GPS communications units, those are the columns, and they were trying to two vehicles communicating and the vehicle behind predicting was the vehicle in front in the lane, i.e. somebody I need to worry about, or was it another lane over and I could ignore? And the, what you see there is the percentage accuracy of those readings. So um, this was sort of automated, mode of grade, but good, good, you know, good equipment. Not, um, not so great, not something you'd want to be betting your life on. Um, this was, you know, there's a lot of other integrity stuff that can be put on top of this, but at the very basic level, this was the problem. Um, you know, determining that relative position between vehicles is, is difficult with GNSS. It's dependent on the device configuration. You know, we see very different numbers there depending on where the antenna was located, how things were doing, that's the difference between the various columns. Um, and without my knowing that in my vehicle, I, I sort of need to know where, which one of these configurations you have before I decide whether to trust you or not. So this gets to this whole issue of I need to trust my own data, but in this communications world, I also need to trust yours. And what is uh, and you need to be able to communicate that. It does raise the possibility of the communications of a local dynamic map where a number of vehicles are talking, discussing what they see, where they are, uh, providing a lot of redundancy. Um, so integrity awareness is that how good is my data, how good is your data, and one thing we really need is some sort of a figure of merit that you can communicate to me to tell me, you know, not only what is your DOP, but do you have a good IMU or a crappy one, you know, what's the consistency across your sensors, when was the last time, how many satellites are you seeing. Um, if there's some way to communicate that, I'm much more likely to trust you. Um, we can also provide correlation with sensor data. You know, if you've got a radar and camera, are we seeing the same objects as reference points? And, um, you know, especially if we have the same map, we can tie into the same coordinate system that way. Um, so collaboration among vehicles is a real opportunity coming ahead to both identify problems in individual vehicles and possibly you know, bad actors out there trying to spoof things. So basically, in conclusion, there are multiple approaches to location on the ground. There, um, this combination of absolute and relative is probably necessary to work in the ground environments. We do need a better quality metric, especially for integrity. Um, but a way, you know, communication is also a way to gain integrity. And you know, I would say right now the positioning in vehicles is good enough for a lot of advisory applications, but we're really not there when we're talking about full automation. So that's it. I'm going to pass it over to you, Demos. Thank you, Chris. All right. So with that, a uh, couple of next steps here. So first of all, uh, today's webinar and a list of references are going to be available on the Inside GNSS webpage after this uh, webinar. Uh, and in addition, if you want more information about so some of the issues that were discussed uh, today, you could uh, visit our sponsors uh, webpage at Novatel, and we have a contact info there for you as well. Um, 
All right. And so before we move on to the last Q&A session here, let's do one more poll. Uh, and if you could cue the poll up, Lori. All right, Demos. We'd like to hear from what you've heard today. How do you plan to enhance the integrity of your un unmanned system? And in this case, you can select more than one response. Feel free to select all that apply. Okay, let's take a look. About 47% saying increased number of redundant sensors, 49% increased quality, reliability of sensor, and 74% use smarter, sophisticated algorithms. So, uh, Demos, any thoughts there? And again, kind of reflects uh, some of the questions that have been coming in, and hopefully we'll be able to address some of the questions you've been asking uh, relative uh, to these answers and to how to increase reliability. So let's move on to the, uh, uh, I guess, the last uh, part of our webinar, which would be asking questions of the experts. And uh, in addition to the three panelists, we have Sheena Dixon from uh, Novotel. She's a project manager for the SPAN product line. And if you have any questions, uh, direct them to her as well. The first question in view of the last uh, poll question is, and I guess I'll direct this one at you at Steve, is what exactly is vector tracking? Can you give us a quick synopsis of it? Sure. Uh, thanks, Demos. Uh, and that's an excellent question and it's a very good technology. Essentially, what we normally do in a GNSS receiver is you may think of a receiver as having 20 channels or 50 or 60, you know, maybe over 100 channels these days. Each channel normally tracks the symbol timing and the carrier uh, phase. And each one of those tracking loops is what we call a scalar loop because it's only looking at one thing. So it's looking at the timing of one signal or the carrier phase of one signal. Um, because it's only looking at one thing, this entire architecture, which actually underpins virtually every receiver for the last 25, 30 years, the, um, is suboptimal because it ignores knowledge that is uh, developed elsewhere in the receiver. The receiver knows, for example, that the aircraft is uh, moving east and now it's turning or going up or it's going into a bank. But that information is not really communicated down to those individual scalar loops. As a result, you wind up losing lock. Once you've lost lock, it's difficult to reacquire because that particular loop doesn't know where to look and so on. A vector tracker looks at, takes all the signals and forms the navigation solution first and then feeds the navigation solution back down into the individual um, detectors, the phase detector and the symbol timing detector and so on. So essentially, you're using, you uh, wrap the um, the tracking loop around the navigation solution instead of tracking first and then calculating a navigation solution. That sounds like um, a simple change, but it turns out to be a game changer in terms of the robustness of the receiver. Um, you you literally pick up um, a, a very significant tracking gain, and it's much more reliable and gives you higher integrity because a single uh, uh, symbol timing loop, for example, or symbol timing observation point cannot be fooled by a spoofer. You have to spoof the entire receiver in order to pull it off, and that turns out to be um, a near impossibility. So it's, it's actually um, uh, a tremendous uh, benefit. Now, the problem is it takes um, a much more uh, rapid navigation solution. You have to be actually calculating at 100 hertz or more to pull this off. Um, but every other part of the receiver is essentially what we've already built. So as things speed up, we'll see more of these vector trackers, and, and that's why it's so powerful. Thank you, Steve. All right, so next question is uh, going to be for uh, Chris. And I guess the various, a lot of variants of that question have come in, so I'll just try to wrap them up into uh, one question, so I could ask, summarize it. Uh, and the question is, do you think it will be possible to reach this integrity level composed of so many nines for ground applications? And that question is from Sophie, but there are a bunch of other, other ones that have asked it as well. But yeah, Chris? Yeah, I think it is. It's, it will not be um, based on individual GNSS stuff. I don't, I don't think we'll get there, but by 
you know, you can imagine these uh, the vector tracking stuff that Steve was talking about. Now you've got if you're doing that on the ground where you also have um, you can use the SLAM techniques where, with cameras of the simultaneous location mapping to uh, you know build up your tracking loops. Uh, you, you've got a lot of information there, and um, the you know GPS GNSS just becomes one of many. I think it's a, a key component because it is essentially what you what you have to do when vehicles are communicating with each other, and um, so you know it's the key component of that. Once we once you can tell me how accurate your data is, but you need to also reflect in that accuracy of your data your your relative positioning stuff. And this is also where if we had a map in common and we could agree that we had the same map, which is a whole another set of problems. And you know you see the light pole and I see the light pole, and if if that fits in. You know, we can start to build a very robust system uh, in, in that method, and the nice thing is that way you can start bringing in other, you know, other vehicles and and uh, you know traffic lights can become a part of it. So, I, I do believe we'll get enough nines here, but it is going to involve significantly more integration than we're at now, um, and GNSS will be a key component of that, but by no means the only one. Thanks, Chris. All right, so here's a question. I guess I'll uh, throw it at Sheena, and I guess there are different variants of it that have come in. Uh, the environment in UAVs and some of these unmanned ground vehicles are pretty harsh from a vibration point of view. Uh, do existing uh, UAV uh, receivers targeted for UAVs use quartz or, uh, quartz or oscillators, or what type of oscillators do they use? Is that a concern? Is that something you need to consider? In the type of receiver, GNSS receivers you put in a, an, up, an un, unmanned vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's something to consider when you're choosing a receiver for to integrate into your UAV. Um, now, the re receivers that we offer at Novatel, we have uh, quartz oscillators in all of those receivers. Uh, we have the regular variant, which supports 7.7 .7 Gs of vibration. Uh, although we also have high vibration variants of those receivers that support up to 20 Gs. So. If vibration is indeed an issue, uh, there are solutions out there for you. All right, thanks. Uh, let's see here. Um, and I guess um, I, I, I'll direct this one at Chris because you alluded uh, to it, and uh, um, it it's, uh, basically has to do with using vision. How hard is it to use images or vision? What, what are the challenges in using it to aid navigation in unmanned vehicles? Um, you know, the biggest challenge is, I guess, figuring out what you're looking at or where that thing is from a navigation perspective. Uh, and there's sort of two ways you can use vision. I think one is the, um, you know, is is my mo you know validating my motion, i.e., I'm closer to that thing or the 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 relative angle changed, and so where I am relative to that thing. Um, but you know that only is a very local solution for navigation. You've got sort of a global solution. You've got to get to somewhere else, and that implies you know knowing something that, in fact, this this picture, this image I see is on the way to where I want to go, rather than just telling me where I am. And that in turn applies implies that there's some sort of a map or database of those images that you can sort of look at and. Um, you know, march your way through or, or use however you want. Um, you know, some people sort of disregard that whole issue of building that database, maintaining it, and so forth. I, I think that's really one of the hardest parts of this whole process is, you know, how do you build that database, keep it up to date, keep it in vehicles that you know, may not have a communications link now. You may be out in the middle of Nevada. Um, it, there's a whole bunch of just sort of not very interesting, but grubby problems that have to be solved to make that work. Not just to mention the cost of uh, automotive memory is much more expensive than what you've got on your your PC now, and maintaining that. Um, there are also spots where there there are no landmarks. So I've uh, heard cases of people having a radar in a car that they shut off after 20 minutes of not seeing anything because, but it was because there was nothing to see for 20 minutes of driving. There was not a target in sight. And so the radar decided it was broken and shut itself down. Um, you know, there's a lot of weird places like that that have to be dealt with. All right. 
Thanks, Chris. Uh, this one, I guess, see, Todd, I guess I'll direct this one at you, and um, if others have any insight, they may also chime in. Um, it's uh, from Paul, and the question is, we've been advised to test, 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 and test uh, guidance and navigation systems for uh, unmanned or remotely piloted vehicles. Uh, do test ranges exist that can accommodate such testing? Any experience with that, and anything you could say to that? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I can address that, at least from the unmanned aircraft standpoint. Um, it might be a bit of a different story on the ground vehicles, but from, an, um, from the UAV standpoint, at least in the United States here, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. So um, uh, the FAA uh, about seven or eight years ago came out with a policy statement that basically clarified the difference between RC airplanes that are basically done for fun you know, in the evenings and the weekends, and uh, what they consider unmanned aircraft for commercial purposes, which could be the very same thing, but you're doing it under some commercial purpose. And they basically said uh, they put a lot of restrictions on, on that, at least for now. So uh, from a testing standpoint, you're faced with a couple options. Um, uh, what we do at UTC Aerospace Systems is we'll go either to um, restricted airspace, somewhere where uh, either the military or some some other government agency has some restricted airspace and then we'd be allowed to fly and test there um, there's other there's also a, a process to get from the FAA what's called a certificate of authorization a COA and then you get special permission to go do uh, UAV flights in certain areas under certain conditions and so we'll do that as well um, and it you know it it's uh, it's something we definitely have to deal with um, because we're testing, we do a test, test, test. We're out testing very regularly, and um, uh, it can be a challenge to to do that. Now, I will say, uh, on the flip side, you know, but because there's been a lot of reg uh, the regulatory environment is a bit constraining. Um, there's a lot of small companies out there who are just sort of skirting the rules and going out to some field somewhere and doing some testing on the side. And um, uh, when you're working for a big company like I do. Uh, that does a lot of work with the FAA. We're just uh, we're not even going to go there, if you know what I mean. So, um, just too much liability. Uh, also, other countries, um, a lot of other countries don't haven't put this type of restrictions on uh, testing of UAVs, or at least not to this level. And so, in that sense, the United States is uh, a bit behind. On the automotive side, anything you could say, Chris, about testing, or is that not an issue, or? Um, it's of course an issue. Um, there's a, a lot of people, you know, using unused. They're taking over unused airports to test automated vehicles and and you know racing tracks when they're not being used. Um, that being said, there's also you know Nissan announced uh, a month or so ago that they were building a test track in Japan designed for testing automated vehicles. Um, you know, so it's getting to be a bigger issue. I think part of what NHTSA is going to come up with is a um, set of tests that vehicles have to pass to be you know, on the road, so test tracks will have to be designed for that. Um, you know, there, I should add, you know, one of the things that's been on vehicle test tracks for many years is sort of endurance testing where you're driving on cobblestones for 200 hours straight. They've automated that in some cases already. You know, people don't like doing that. Um, but that's needed to test the, you know, vehicle systems. So there is some there already. All right. Thanks, Chris. Let's see. Next question. I think I'll direct this one at Sheena, and if uh, Steve wants to answer, he can too. Uh, so RTK, the perhaps the most accurate positioning that we have that would be great in many of these vehicles and many of these app UAV applications or unmanned vehicle applications, is very sensitive. Uh, to cycle slips uh, and things like that. Uh, how do you cope with this? What's the, uh, um, and uh, small vehicles? Um, that's a good question. One of the things that we do here at Novatel uh, in our SPAN product line, which is a GNSS inertial product line, is a, a tightly coupled solution. So uh, a lot of times when you lose RTK, it's due to losing lock on satellites or uh, bad tracking in general. Um, so a lot of the, the poor tracking can be eliminated with integrating an inertial sensor uh, that 
kind of backs it up and, and do some sort of integrity checking on your tracking. And at the same time, when you lose lock on a satellite, uh, we can regain tracking on that satellite within a second with inertial aiding through this tightly coupling. So with the fast reacquisition time, we're able to regain the, the RTK uh, position within a second or two, rather than your typical 10 to 15 seconds without inertial aiding. Um, thanks. Uh, Steve, anything to say on that, especially from a point of view when you talk about integrity and the fact that you actually use this on uh, ScanEagle, I guess? Yeah, those were good answers. Uh, the other thing that we found, we started our development for this way back uh, in 2000, well, you know, I don't know, way back, 2002, 2003, and we ran into uh, the dark ages back then. And uh, so we discovered that, uh, that buying a dual frequency receiver, which was the, the high end in those days, was absolutely critical. So I'd say the more signals, the better. Um, we do have uh, the aircraft banks a lot. We we limited the bank on final approach, uh, minimized the dynamics of the situation, and then the more signals you have available in an RTK solution, the more likely you'll be able to uh, retain uh, uh, RTK lock with very you know with those very tight accuracy bounds. So that and and the tight coupling are, are the two ways to go. Oh, and I also noticed that some of these questions were addressing. Uh, multiple antennas and, and so on. Uh, I have not experimented with that. My suspicion is that that would not work with RTK, or at least it would be uh, problematic, and you'd have a lot of other issues to solve. So single antenna, um, but lots of signals. And uh, I, I, yeah, I agree with the, the multiple, multiple antenna comment, um, especially from the inertial side. If you integrate an IMU with your uh, UAV, it, it's sufficient enough to bridge those outages without having a, a secondary signal input source. So I don't think that's absolutely necessary. And it simplifies uh, the whole integration altogether with just adding an IMU into your solution. All right. Uh, we have tons of questions coming in. Unfortunately, we only have a limited amount of time. Uh, so with that, move it over to, um, to our sponsor. Thanks so much, Demos. And Folks, yes, it is about that time, and um, why don't we go ahead and wrap things up, and we'll have Sheena Dixon come on from Novatel and leave us with a brief word. Sheena? Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining our webinar today. Uh, if you have any questions regarding Novatel products, such as our receivers, antennas, anti-jam products, or our Novatel Span and our GNSS products, uh, please don't hesitate to contact myself or visit our website at www.novatel.com. All right. Thanks so much, Sheena. And, and before we sign off, I would like to take a moment to thank each of you for joining us and trust that you found today to be of value. Special thanks go to Stephen, Chris, Todd, and of course to our sponsor and co-host, Novatel and Inside GNSS. Also like to thank our logistics producer, Patty Van Hooser, for her behind the scenes collaboration and support. Most importantly, again, thanks for joining. This is Lori Dearman saying have a great rest of the week. Bye for